Yeah. <laughs> right, everybody, well, welcome to the RSFA YouTube, and today I've got with me Jim Grattan from Child Protection. So, Jim, can you outline your role in the Irish Football Association for me? Uh, yes, well, uh, my role, or specifically, it's a two person role uh, myself and, and, and Jessica. Uh, we basically are in, in charge of uh, anything that we do with Child Protection, or as the, the new terminology calls it, safeguarding. Um, and that we can, our area really covers every, every part of the IFA, from international teams right down to affiliated uh, boys clubs and girls clubs and teams. So it's a, it's a, it's a big remit. Very good. And, and what is the IFA's child protection policy at the moment? Um, well, basically, the welfare, the welfare of, of children is paramount. And, um, we're there to to make sure that uh, every 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 kid gets an opportunity to play football uh, in, a, in a fun and a fun and, and safe environment. Uh, and you know, a lot a lot of the stuff in, in terms of child protection will be making sure we have things in place where education becomes the the key to it. That we educate people uh, in certain areas of, of child protection, uh, so that uh, the, the bad aspects of the game are kept to a minimum. Okay. And so what do your child protection policies in the IFA actually contain? Well, um, one, one of the, you know, it would be, like I said, their education would be the key. We do courses, um, probably in the region of maybe uh, 50, 50 a year, 50, 60 child protection awareness courses. And that would be for anybody involved in football, from our, our level one coaching awards, uh, club, club, uh, Clubs would do their own courses, and we would come out and deliver that. And again, those are those are all endorsed by NSPCC, who we, we work very very closely with. And that would be to educate people on on, on aspects of, of of child protection um, and inappropriate behaviour and abuse and stuff, and making sure that there, there's good standards. But also, the vetting is is a huge part of, of our remit. And uh, we're now in a situation as governing body where. Anybody who, who is uh, doing a, a coaching award with us has to go through uh, a police check and vetting procedures to make sure that they're appropriate to, to work with children. Um, and that, that would be the two, two main areas in terms of the child protection. Why has the IFA implemented these child protection policies and procedures? Um, well, it's, it's, it's just the way things are going. Uh, the IFA, uh, uh, as governing body for uh, all football in Northern Ireland um, has a, a huge responsibility in terms of uh, making sure that these things are in place. Um, and certainly they took that on board going back now till 19, uh, sorry, 2005 um, uh, was when they, they, they made a the decision to do this. And they've made huge strides in the area. The job's growing and growing. Um, I don't know where it's going to stop. But certainly, um, um, we, we're getting busier and busier as we go along. We also, the, you know, in terms of developing resources, uh, again, it's uh, you know, it's it's an area where uh, we haven't even mentioned yet, and we, it's our responsibility to make sure the resor resources are out there for people to to access um, if they need to to learn about child protection. One of the areas, uh, you know, we've our ambassador Johnny Adams, who has been working with us now for about two and a half years and does a lot of good work in terms of the promotion of the program because t people tend to think as child protection being a tick box and it certainly isn't and Johnny would be um, you know very good in terms of promoting uh, welfare and, and child protection in football. And okay. um, I've been hearing a wee bit about around the IFA about um, player welfare can you tell us a wee bit about that? Player welfare is uh, something we've been uh, sort of toying with for uh, the past year or so I've been speaking within the realms of the IFA about trying to do something um, a wee bit more positive um, and something close to myself because I worked seven years with the under 17 international team um, aside from my job and I've worked with most of the players who have come through uh, in that period of time 
Um, and we always, one of the people we've just mentioned, Johnny Evans, who, who is now a star, and certainly a star of the future, and doesn't have uh, too many worries about his future. The majority of kids who go across to England don't get that opportunity. Um, within a couple of years, a lot of them would be, be coming home again. I feel, and certainly now the FA feels we've got a responsibility as a government body to look after these kids and make sure that when they do come home, um, where we, we meet with them, meet with their parents, um, as we were recently with the PFA in England, looking at what was available in terms of grants, uh, um, to make sure these kids get back into football here locally. Uh, certainly, they're good enough to play Irish league level, so what's the best club for them? But more importantly, you know, what have they got educationally, and, and what can what what can be put in place so they get an education, so they're going to have a future, maybe outside of football. Um, so it's, it's it's a very very important role, and, and something I I would uh, I like to, to embrace. Okay, good. Well, thank you very much for telling our YouTube listeners all about the Irish FA's child protection policies. Welcome to the Irish Football Association YouTube site and today we've got with us William Campbell and he's going to talk to us a wee bit about the history of the IFA. So William. Um, can you tell us a wee bit about the history of the IFA, please? The Irish Football Association, Rachel, is the fourth oldest football association in the world, founded in 1880. And that followed with England, England, Scotland, Wales went before us. Uh, that uh, has given us a big input, I think, into the way that football has been uh, run over the past 120, 130 years. We were at the beginning of the, the laws and, and creating the laws and played a, a creative role in that. Uh, obviously, there's been a big change. Um, in the association over the past 125, 130 years. The biggest one being when it was founded in 1880, it covered the whole island. And uh, obviously in the, in the 1920s, there was a division between what was the IFA and what then became the FAI, the Football Association of Ireland. Great. And can you tell us a bit about this man up behind you here? Uh, Lord Chichester, uh, Spencer Chichester, was the first president of the IFA. And he took that role at the first meeting of the IFA, which was held in November 1880. And he represented the Myola Park Club, based in Castle Dawson, that is still in existence. Uh, and at the very first meeting of, of the IFA, they decided that they would have a Challenge Cup competition, the Irish Cup. And Myola Park won the very first competition. And it was the very first and only time that they had won the Irish Cup competition. And how many people were in that first Irish Cup competition? I think it was 12 clubs. 12 clubs. Um, and football in those days was played under various rules. And uh, James McAleary, who, who founded the IFA, he was Secretary of Cliftonville, he sent a, a, put an advert in the paper inviting people to come to a meeting in, in the Royal Hotel, Botanic Avenue, not quite sure where that is now. <laughs> the Royal Hotel is not there anymore. Um, for those clubs who were, who were playing Scottish rules, and there were obviously Scottish rules and English rules. So um, James McAleary himself had been to Scotland and seen the game played there, and he had brought it back and had helped create Cliftonville, who are the oldest club in, in, in Ireland. So that was the, the basis of the meeting, and the representatives decided that they would all pay a, a shilling as their subs for the year and have an Irish Cup competition. And then they met another week later to, to formulate some rules. Okay. Now, it's true that I hear that the Irish Football Association's headquarters is actually an old house belonging to a famous person from Northern Ireland? Yes, um, the building that we're sitting in, 20 Winter Avenue, was once lived in by Thomas Andrews, who, uh, who designed and built the Titanic. Uh, and it, it is likely that he probably left this building to go and get on the Titanic when they were heading off on their maiden voyage to America. Very good. Now, can you tell us a wee bit about sort of the key moments off the pitch for the, Northern, or for the Irish Football Association? As I said at the beginning, um, because we're the fourth oldest in, in the world, we have had a, a role to play, particularly in the shaping of the rules. And there's a group 
body called the International Football Association Board that is responsible for making the rules of world football and it's made up of the representatives of the four British associations plus FIFA. And they meet uh, once every year in, in, in one of the, the uh, constituent bodies in, in 2009. They actually met here in Northern Ireland. In 1891, the IFA was responsible for introducing the penalty kick and it was a, a, a proposal from the IFA. Uh, and that came from William McCrum uh, from Milford County Armagh. He, he was the goalkeeper for Milford. Mm -hmm. And he had proposed to the IFA that we put forward the idea that if someone uh, fouled or handled the ball uh, towards the goal, then there would be a free kick, if you like, a free kick with uh, nobody challenging it. In those days, there wasn't a penalty spot as there is today. Uh, and the kick would, could be taken for 12 yards from the goal anywhere. 12 yards in front of the goal. Um, it had been proposed, first of all, in 1890 and rejected by the International Board because the FA, the English, said that a gentleman would not deliberately kick another gentleman. So it was rejected. But 12 months later, it was introduced, and in fact, the English seconded the proposal. Which is, that's a very significant, I think it's a very significant position, um, something that we, we were involved in. The other big one, I suppose, is the offside law, which was changed in the 1920s because of a Northern Irish player called Billy McCracken. And it was his style of play. He created um, the opportunity so that, that offside was, was created basically as we know it today, but you had to be behind the second last defender. That was because he played right up against the goalkeeper, in front of the goalkeeper. So they had to change the laws to try to adapt to that. And probably in more modern times, a significant gentleman uh, in world football was Harry Cavan, who was president of the IFA from 1958 up to about 19, uh, 1995, I think, 1994, 95. And during that time, for 30 years of that time, he was vice president of FIFA and often would have represented FIFA throughout the world. Harry was a trade union official from, from Newton Arts, whose club was Ards, and was right up to his death, he still would have attended matches for, for Ards. Um, and at that time, he would have traveled the world representing FIFA was very responsible, very much responsible for introducing a lot of the development programs that FIFA put in place and introducing football back into the, into the Olympic Games in the format that we have it today as, as an under-21 uh, tournament. And, and Harry played a very significant role in all that. And if you travelled the world, he was fated like a, a celebrity. Um, limousines would have met uh, the Northern Ireland team at uh, on, on the tarmac at airports and they would have whisked Harry through customs whilst our players, first division players and so on, had to go through the normal channels. It's quite mm -hmm. ir ironic. So Northern Ireland sort of football has really shaped world football in a way then would you say? I think we have. Um, obviously we've created, for a small country um, with a population of only one and a half million, we are where up until I think Trinidad played in the 2006 World Cup probably the smallest country by population to actually be represented in a World Cup final tournament. And if you imagine, we've been to three World Cup finals, uh, and these are the representative uh, emblems that we get from FIFA for doing that. And we've reached the second phase on two occasions, in 58 and in 82. And then um, we're only pipped in goal difference from going through the second round in, in, in 86. I think that's very significant. I think the 58 team um, was a very good team very impoverished, if you like, and compared to what we have today and, and the way that footballers are, are looked after. But they sort of were brought together um, with some very good players like Danny Blanchflower, with Google Keeper and Harry Gray. Um, and with a very innovative tactical thinker uh, as a manager and coach in Peter Doherty. So that you bring all that together. Yeah. Um, I think that was what, probably where our success on the field came from. And then 20 or 24 years later in 82, with something similar where we had a, a spattering of, of very, very good players at the top of their game, like Pat Jennings and uh, um, Jerry Armstrong, Norman Whiteside and so on, um, complemented by the tactile genius of, of Billy Bingham. Right, well at the moment we're going through our World Cup qualifiers and stuff. Do you think, how do you think it compares to the last time Northern Ireland qualified? I think when uh, the history of football in Northern Ireland is written, People will look back and, and see the 2005 onwards period probably as a very strong one. Um, we've very, we were very close to qualification for the European finals. As you know, with um, David Healy's 13 goals being making the top ever goal scorer in, in European qualification championship. And now we've, uh, we're now topping the group in our World Cup qualification going into the final 
uh, autumn to a couple of months of, of matches, which I think is very good and makes it very competitive. Um, probably we don't have the big superstars that we had either in 58 or in, uh, in 82, 86. But I think probably as a group, we're, we're a strong group. Interestingly enough, we are managed by someone who played in the last World Cup campaign that we were successful in, which was Nigel Worthington, who played in 86. Mm -hmm. And of course, Billy Bingham played in 58, and he manages in 82. So whether you're looking for omens, I don't know. <laughs> um, but certainly, it, as a group, some of the, the, the results we've had recently, not only beating England and Spain, um, but even right up to date in, in the, the double header where we, where we beat Poland and Slovenia. Um, I think puts us up there and, and certainly very competitive in world football. Thank you very much Rachel, for your time. You. And there you go, you've probably heard some things here you haven't heard before, so keep a lookout for more videos on our IFA YouTube.